Mornings, good to see you today. Praise the Lord, I'm glad you're here in church with us. Uh, don't let the sermon title scare you if you're... This is the second in our series on the home, and especially this part, this Sunday and next Sunday, uh, I think it's a very, very important message that we have because it not only extends to the areas of your home and facing the need in your home and family, but this is a message, even if you're not married, all right, that deals with resolution and conflict, you know, settlements, that uh, married, single, business, whatever, you know, this is going to help you in, in so many different regards. So uh, even though it's, it's part of our home series of message, it certainly is meant to minister and to help each and every one of us because uh, this is the relationship world we live in, whether it's business relationship, neighbors, family, friends, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, or, or the guy at work. This, all, these principles apply to each and every one of these areas. So I encourage you to listen carefully. Uh, sometimes when we have a m series of messages and someone, well, that really not me because, you know, I'm a, I'm a single or I'm maybe I'm divorced and have a marriage relationship or whatever you go through. And different. Listen, there's always something from the Word of God we can glean whatever the message is, but I really do honestly want to share with this the message that will help you in so many different areas and so many different regards to your, to your life and to the world that you live in. So I encourage you to pay real close attention to it. You know, we have a, you, usually a reading of, the, of a passage at this point in time, and we'll do so today, but I'll just let you know it is one verse, but I do think we should honor the Word of God as we read the Word of God by standing one more time with me. And let's look at this verse. It's found in Mark chapter 3 when Jesus is speaking. And he says in Mark chapter 3, verse 25, I do have it on the screen here, it says that the family that divides itself into groups that fights each other, that family will fall apart. Uh, the home filled with strife and division destroys itself. Another translation of what we have on the board, a house divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. Somebody say amen to the word of God this morning. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. You know, the house divided against itself, we've used this on a national sense, in a home sense, in a business sense, in a team sense. It is so true. If the house is filled with arguments and strife and conflicts that are never resolved, then how are you ever going to expect to have peace in your life on any level? So I want to focus in on this, how to, have, how to have peace, or what is the peace plan, and how can we really have that in our life? Because as I look across homes and, and marriages today, I see so much trouble the multitude of divorces that we face in our culture. Obviously, there's not a lot of uh, people that know how to resolve problems and how to settle conflicts, and the communication issues are certain, certainly faltering and failing, not only in the home front, but on so many different levels, people are having problems in relationships. You know, uh, conflict, by the way, let me say this, is common in life. And in case you don't know, maybe you're newly married in the room today, let me say to you, you lest nobody warns you that uh, conflict is common in marriage. It's not uncommon. If you got married with an expectation that just because you both love Dr. Pepper, that all your other problems, you're in for a definitely a rude awakening. Can I get another amen? Yeah. <laughs> you're two different people, two different personalities, two different backgrounds, two different ways of living, and now you're coming under the same roof you can expect that there's going to be issues and conflicts and things that you will have disagreements on. Don't think that you're going to agree on everything all the time. A lot of people run from conflict. They're, oh, I, we, we, we had an argument. Life's, yeah, get a, I'm a lawyer. You know, uh, Realize that that's, it's the norm, but it needs to be dealt with in a right way because certainly conflict can cause a lot of trouble and create a lot of strife and a lot of broken hearts. But please understand that there, there's resolutions and that, that the conflict can be healthy for your relationship because it lets you begin to know each other the way you really need to know each other and understand each other on a level that's going to be beneficial for both of you. God gives you, you know, we use the old thing about the opposites attract. If God gave you an opposite, that's a good thing, all right? Because you'll find out their strengths are probably in the areas of your own weaknesses and your strengths are probably in the areas where there's a weakness and you will complement each other. But that's not just true in marriage and in family. That's true out in the world in general. If we approach life with this attitude that, you know, that the my way is the only way, then we're certainly going to struggle. But it's, uh, it's, conflict's going to be the norm in, in every situation. It's how you deal with conflict and how you deal with each other in that conflict that's important. If you're the kind of person who doesn't want to deal with it, then you're going to face a lot of problems. 
I've always felt it ought to be mandatory that anybody that goes and gets a marriage license also has to go through a conflict resolution course. <laughs> I think it would resolve a lot of the divorce issues that happen in our culture. A lot of them could be solved this way. Uh, I mean, I, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I wonder how many of you really had somebody sit down with you before you were married and show you, you know, how to deal and how to resolve disagreements, you know, and how to deal with those things in your marriage and life. So we always encourage anybody that we marry at Believers Fellowship that they go through our pre-marriage class so we can talk to them about the issues they're going to face. Now, most of them sit through that part of the lesson thinking, that's not us. I mean, we both love the same hamburger, you know, and... We, we, we just both love, you know, the certain things in life and the same TV shows. This is going to be great. Listen, conflict is inevitable. And the more you know how to deal with those kind of things and how to deal with those issues, you know, it's, it, the better it's going to be. The fact is kind of like cracking an egg. If you look at an egg once it's cracked open, those sides are completely opposite of each other now. And if you don't line them up properly with the opposites in the right place, you know, you're just going to crush the egg even further. They, they, they came apart. Now, in marriage, we are completely opposite many times. We need to find the resolution. And part of the journey, dear friends, is learning how to discover how to make that whole egg again, so to say. But every, every, every person is unique. And with the uniqueness of each individual comes the difference of them being unique in areas that you're not so unique in. And now you're going to have to have a, probably a, a conflict and a resolution that follows. So I want to talk about three things. And this, we're going to break this down into two parts. I was going to share it. I, I think I dealt with this back in 2004 in one of our marriage uh, uh, re uh, retreats that we had. And I, I, this was one of the topics that I dealt with. And I covered this portion all in one time. But... I really rushed through it, so I want to slow it down today and, and give you a little more details within the point. I'm going to break this into two messages. We're going to talk about the reasons today for, the, for conflicts and reactions to conflict, and then we'll start dealing with the resolutions, and we'll start on that and continue with the resolutions next week. So if you're really geared for a big fight this week, hold off. <laughs> Till next week. Till you really get, now you can, I'm just kidding, but I'm saying there, this is a, there's more to come with in, in part of this message. There's five major issues I said many years ago when I preached on this that people deal with in their homes. I've added a couple to it and because these are still there. Now, these are in no particular order when you talk about money and sex and communications, having children, or if we have children, disciplining children, in-laws, Technology is now new into the list, uh, iPads, iPhones, everybody's stuck it with their head in their devices and don't talk anymore, and that creates major problems and chaos within a, within a relationship. And then, last but not least, I think this has become a major cause of conflict, mostly because of millennials, but chores. <laughs> Who's going to do what? Well, I never took out the trash at home. Well, you're going to take out the trash now. No. On and on it goes. Who's going to be responsible for these the household responsibilities in this relationship. Now, uh, I was thinking, you know, there probably ought to be one more on here, number eight, and it's called Pastor Joe's Driving. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's a conflict issue at your house or not, but my wife, you know, she uh, usually has a conflict with my driving. She has, I, I call them air brakes. I don't know what she's doing, but she's, I don't know if she's hitting the air brakes or whatever they are, or grabbing the dashboard or going to move somebody out of the way or what it is. Anybody else have that similar reaction to their driving? Got a hearty amen, so <laughs> praise the Lord. So I'm not the only one. Misery loves company in that regard. But these are problems that people face. You think, well, these are so simple, they'll be able to work them out. But it doesn't always happen that way. I said we'd start with, number one, the reasons for conflict. And I've got a passage in James I'll share with you. There's two verses, and it says, What causes quarrels and, and what causes the fights among you? Is, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire, you do not have, and you, you murder. Hopefully not in your situation. You covet, you can't obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. The answer for the number one cause of conflict is pretty much it's competing desires. You want what you want. They want what they want. And when, that's fine as long as what you want is what they want, or what they want is what you want. But when what you want is different from what they want, or vice versa, what they want is different from what you want, then all of a sudden you have competing needs, and you have competing interests, and competing opinions, all right? 
So how are you going to resolve those things? I, one of the first things I always tell people to do in marriage, not first, but along the line of things, you really want to solve some, resolve some conflicts in your life. Uh, <clears throat> when you get married, buy an electric blanket for the wintertime, but make sure it has dual controls. <laughs> it's too hot. It's too cold. I mean, how many have a spouse that likes to cover up even in the summertime, and you want no covers on you at all, and, you know, so... That's just a simple illustration of what we're talking about. There's just competing desires. People have different attitudes, different opinions, different ways, the way they like things, different upbringings. Someone said marriage goes through three stages. The first stage is the happy honeymoon. That's always the best part, amen? The second stage is the party's over. The third stage is let's make a deal. Now, most people don't get to the let's make a deal stage, all right? They can make a deal with their lawyer, I guess, but they never get to the stage of let's make a deal. You know, let's, let's find how to, how to deal with this. And again, it gets back to the fact just a lot of people have never dealt with how, 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 how do you deal with problems? And maybe you had a home that didn't ever learn how. You came up in a home that didn't know how to deal with problems. There's about five reactions that people have to conflicts in their life and how they're going to deal with the conflicts in their, in their home, their problems in life or whatever it might be. Uh, you decide which of these ways is your approach to dealing. The number one is my way, all right? What is my way? <laughs> That's my way. I am always right. And I'm going to impose my way. And I'm going to assert my way, and we're going to make sure we do it my way. It's that old my way or the highway. Well, you know, let me give you a simple bit of advice on my way. You're going to be an awful lonely person in life. Because it never works and it never brings any resolution. If you have this idea that I'm always right, I'm never wrong, and if I'm wrong, it's only because I was wrong about being wrong. So I'm really always right. If that's your approach, you're certainly going to miss it. Second approach to dealing with conflicts is, well, it's no way. I'm just, you know, this is just, just I, I'm going to withdraw. I just don't like conflicts. I don't like problems. You know, it's that, that, that stick my head in the sand approach or the turtle method where you just push yourself into your shell and you just let your shell get harder and harder. You back away from conflicts or you just ignore conflicts. At all costs, I'll avoid conflicts. It's just easier that way. Well, it may seem easier, but nothing's ever resolved. And by the way, you're probably becoming, you know, just a, a, a dynamite in, inside. Sooner or later, you're just, you're just going to explode because you keep pressing all that stuff down. It's, it's like the garbage can, you know. And you, it's, if you have the chore of taking out the garbage, that's my chore at the house. You know, I take the garbage out. Kathy has a way of letting me know when it needs to go out. It's like I can't figure it out. But she lets me know. Now, it's never when I think it needs to go out. Her opinion about the garbage is different from my opinion about the garbage. My opinion, if it's full, I can push it down. <laughs> you know, my smelling's not good as hers, apparently. So it stinks. No, no problem. Close it up. What happens? You keep pressing it down, pretty soon the bag's going to explode. All right. If you're doing that internally with stuff, and you're just holding garbage in, Sooner or later, it's going gonna, it's gonna to explode on you. So the, the no way just doesn't really work. It's not going to work out for you. The third way that people deal with the problems is, is halfway. Uh, uh, I mean, the your way. The your way says, <clears throat> I'll just be a doormat. I'm just going to roll over and play dead again. I'm just, you know, I just don't want to deal with this. So we're just, whatever you want, you're going to do anyway. Whatever you want, just go ahead and do it. I'll, whatever you want, and that's the your way. Your way is another one of those issues which creates a lot of internal stress and a lot of internal anxiety, and pretty soon, sooner or later, it's going to be a mess. It may be a peaceful way for living in the moment, but it's not going to really work out, and it's a very frustrating way to choose to live your life. Now, if you're the you of the your way, it's no problem for you, right? <laughs> but it doesn't work. The fourth way is halfway. We'll give in some. You give in some. We'll win some. We lose some. But, hey, it's, it's, it's better than the first three. But, you know, I, I'll go, as long as we halfway, we're okay. Well, that's not necessarily the right way either. All right? And you might make compromises, and, but they may not be compromises you maybe really ought to be making at all. And they may be making compromises, and maybe they shouldn't be compromising at all. I've always said that God gives us spouses in our relationship to help us in life, you know. The Bible makes it very clear that when... Eve was presented to Adam, she was there to complete his life and to bring fulfillment so that both of their lives would experience a fulfillment of having that other person. Uh, number one, it's not good for man to be alone or a woman to be alone. So 
here's this relationship God introduces for them to, to have fullness in the relationship. Kathy is, is a tremendous sounding board for me. She, I'm a tremendous sounding board for her. We can provide warning signs to each other. We see each other making a choice or a move or moving towards something that we really feel is not the right way. We can encourage one another. We can hey, say, hey, have you thought about this? So we're there to bring help and assistance and encouragement and, and fulfillment to, to each other's lives. So this halfway is not always the best way to go. You say, then what is the best way to go? Our way. And by the way, let me tell you about our way. It really starts with having an open heart so we really know what God's way is. We talked last week on the home. We talked about the home, the place for caring. And we realized that our home ultimate is to be for the glory of God, that whatever we do, we do for the glory of God. And our lives are for the glory of God. So the best thing for my relationship to my wife is to be concerned about the glory of God. That we, remember how many times we used the phrase last week in those passages from Colossians and 1 Peter and also from Ephesians where it says, as unto the Lord, as fitting to the Lord, in the Lord. That's really the way. And that's the way that we should go. That should be the, the goal that we're focusing for because we are, because God has done a work. Of, and, and when we said, I do at the altar, God did a work of making us one. And we need to discover what that one way is. Now, you may think, well, that's my way, obviously. No, it's our way. It's her way. No, it's our way. And we can discover what God is doing in us and with us and through us and what he's trying to work out in us. That's the, what, that's the goal in mind. That's where we want to head in our life, that we have now this mutual life, this mutual concern, a life of now respecting one another and enjoying the will of God in our lives. So now we care about each other, and we care about what would threaten each other. We care about solving the problems. We care about developing the relationship. I care about you. You care about me. So we want a resolution that is mutually satisfi satisfying and encouraging to who we now are in Christ Jesus. But what happens? We said, well, we have that reason for the conflict, our competing desires. So this is something we have to be on guard about. It's something we have to be cautious about. It's something we need to be reminded about. That's why we do every year marriage retreats and marriage conferences because we want to develop, you know, our relationship before the Lord with each other. So it's important we understand that there, there's reactions to, to, to these conflicts in our life, and we need to make sure that, that the reactions are heading in the right direction so that our, our conflicts are, are, are putting us, pointing us towards the oneness of who we are, and our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's, let's deal with the third thing I said I would talk about, which would be the resolutions, amen, to conflict. And there's eight steps of revolution that we'll cover. We'll get started on today, and we'll cover part next week as we'll look at these, these resolutions or the ways that we can respond to each other. Now, understand, these are biblical ways to deal with things. This will not be in Dr. Phil's manual. All right. Some of them may, but I can pretty much guarantee the first won't. All right. But these are biblical principles that we need to apply to our relationships with each other, our relationships in the church, our relationship in our own families, brother to brother, sister to sister, you know, mother to father, father to mother, all along the board. These are things that will help you in the whole of your life and will bring great fulfillment to your life. So no matter where you are, you're going to have conflicts in life. I'd embrace these, all right? Let's start with what I consider to be the most important step from God's Word on how to resolve conflicts. This, this is an important thing. It's called becoming a believer, giving your life to Jesus. Ephesians 2.16, the apostle writes these words, as part of the same body, our anger against each other has disappeared, for both of us have been reconciled to God, and so the feud has ended at the cross. Now, he's talking about a relationship to Gentile, to Jew, to Christ, now that we're all brought together through Jesus Christ, to the Father. But the, the idea here is that God has reconciled us through the cross, all right, and made us all one in him. That has to be transferred, the principle does, to our marriages and to our relationships where we realize the cross is the ground we all come to. Jesus is who we all submit to. And when we come to him, life really begins. Now, I can't reiterate this enough. I know maybe you sit in church and you've been here as long as I've been here, and you probably can't count any more than I can count how many times I've told people, told the church, reminded us all that the most important thing we'll ever do in our life is the most important is to give our hearts and to give our lives to Jesus Christ. Have you heard that from up here before? 
<laughs> Let me remind you again. The most important decision you will ever make in your life is not where you're going to go to school, not who you're going to marry, if you're going to do this or that, what kind of car you're going to buy. It's going to be what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? What are you going to do with Jesus? That's the most important critical issue of your life because until we come to Christ, we are isolated from God. And we need God, all right? And without him, we have no hope. If our lives are not committed to Christ, no matter how moral, no matter how decent, and even this, no matter how religious you might be, your life not really needs to be. Scripture makes it very clear in principle that Adam and Eve, before God, right with God, God created a perfect fellowship with him. They sinned against God. And the Bible tells us because they sinned, that sin passed upon all men. All right? It became the nature that was transferred from Adam and Eve to every person that is born. We are all born with a sin nature. Let me put that in real common English for you. You want what you want, all right? You want what you want, and it doesn't matter what others say, doesn't matter what God says, you want what you want, and no matter how you dress it up with religion, you may get baptized, sprinkled, confirmed, somebody may bless your life, you may experience some kind of religious event in your life, but until you really surrender your heart to Jesus Christ, you don't have what you need because the Bible tells us while we are separated from God because of our sin nature, seeking ultimately to please ourselves, that we're alienated from the power of God, from the blessings of God, and from the grace of God. All right? So I'm. Bible says in Ephesians, we are dead in our trespasses and sin. In other words, you're not even really fully alive till you come to Jesus Christ. You say, Brother Joe, I am a good person. Fine, I appreciate that. We all do. But you need Jesus Christ to save you from your sin, from the penalty of your sin, from the power of your sin. Only Jesus does that. It's not my morality, not preaching, not good efforts, not good works, not Sunday school, not going to Bible studies. It's giving my heart to Jesus Christ. So let me ask you that thing. Have you done that? Has there ever been a time in your life when you gave your heart to Jesus Christ? The Bible says make your calling and election sure. What does that mean? <laughs> make sure you know Jesus, you know? The Bible says see if you're really in the faith. There ought to be a point when you just hit our brakes for a moment and say, Let's affirm the fact, has there ever been a time in my life when I gave my heart to Jesus? Now, if there hasn't, then you don't have a foundation. Jesus made it clear. If you don't build upon him, his word, his truth, and he says, you've got to have a foundation. He said, troubles are going to come, the wind's going to blow, the rains are going to fall, and the floods are going to come. He said, if you've only built your house on sand, which means you've decided you have your own plan, your own way, and that's going to work for you, you know what the Bible says. You know what God says. But it's not your cup of tea. You're going to do it your way. He says, when the troubles come, your house is not going to stand. Your house is going to fall apart. He said, but if you'll take your life and build it upon the Word of God and upon Jesus Christ, you, he said, it's, the wind's still going to come, and the troubles are going to come, and everything, and th those represent the, the wind and the flood and, and, and the rains. They represent the world, the flesh, and the devil, things that assault us in this life, conflicts, trials, tribulation, persecution. When you go through those things, it's a different story for you. You have a place to stand because you have God in your life and you've built your life on him and upon his word. The most important thing that has to happen in your life is you need to make sure that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've got, it's got to be more than just, well, my religion is this or my religion is that or my denomination is this. There's got to be a heart. The Bible says, for with the heart a man believes unto righteousness. There's got to be a heart decision that's followed up by a commitment to Jesus Christ. By the way, if it is a heart decision, there will be a commitment. If it's a head decision, it's usually absent a commitment of any real depth or really concern. So if there's a problem in your, in your family, if there's a problem in your home, number one, what are you building on? Are you on the rock? Are you on Jesus Christ? Are you on solid ground? Because that is where it all starts. You have to become a believer. I believe there's a lot of marriages that would be restored and a lot of marriages would be saved if they really sought to say, hey, we have got an issue, but we're going to see what God does, says about it and what God wants to do about it. Because if we trust God and we believe in the power of God and we believe in prayer, then I believe that God can do something with our life and with our home. 
Now, it's obvious, I've seen the statistics, it's probably you have, that it's almost now that as many people who profess to be Christians have experienced as many divorces there as they have in the people who don't confess to be Christians, all right? That those rates are pretty getting closer every day. But they have discovered the families that are committed to Christ and regularly attend church, pray together, and read their Bible, the divorce rate there is very minimal. That ought to be a good sign right there. I need to find my life in Jesus Christ. I need to be involved in his kingdom and his work and his church and do what he's called me to do and seek to be what all he's called me to be. Because if I'm going to follow Jesus, then it means that, hey, I'm going to have to make some decisions in my life to get things right with God. If I'm going to be right with you, I have to be right with God. If I'm going to be right with God, I have to be right with you. But if you don't make that decision, you know, you're going to have trouble. It's amazing that God, when I came to him and he, he drew me to the cross, and there I gave my life to Jesus, that in that moment, the Bible says we're all changed, right? We become a new, new person. But you know what God did in that moment? He gave me a desire now to do what's right. He gave me a desire to do what's right. But not only did he give me a desire to do what's right, he gave me the power to do what's right. Now, this is where we have to step out in faith. This is where we have to make a concerted commitment to believe God and what he said in his word. But he's given me the ability. So God's given me the power and a desire. God gave me a desire to have a home that would glorify him, but he gave me the power to do it at the same time. These, again, these principles spread across every area of your life in every relationship of your life. Become a believer. Second one, you probably won't find out in a lot of these other uh, humanistic approaches to marriage counseling, but you, you've got to learn to pray. James puts it this way. It's competing desires. You do not have what you do want. You murder your covet. You can't obtain. You fight and you quarrel, and you do not have because you do not ask. Now, he's not talking about me asking you or asking my wife or your wife asking husband. You don't ask God. That's the inference here. How many problems would be settled in our life if we talked to God first about it? These competing desires that I'm having, maybe I need to talk to God about them. Maybe I need to find out what I'm wanting is really even in God's will to start with. But here, here's this kind of this invitation that's laid out. You're having all these conflicts. Why don't you come and talk to it about the Father? Why don't you talk to the Father about this? Why don't you get with God about this? God is waiting for you to ask him. I think what we have happened instead of that, we have these needs in our life, and we are just certain that when you married him or you married her, that that person was going to meet these needs in your life. Now, you need to listen carefully to this. If you're single, think about getting married. There's no man and woman out there that's going to meet all your needs. I'm sorry to say that. You may not won't be ready to hear that, you know. But if you're looking for that perfect person who's going to meet all your needs, it's not going to happen. I don't care if you marry St. Paul. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. And by the way, it's never what God intended anyway. God is the one who meets our needs, all our needs. And I have discovered in my own personal walk, and I've been walking a long time, <laughs> you know, that God, God brings th things into my life where only he can meet. And if I expect Kathy to meet them or my family to meet them, somebody in the church to meet them, you know, I'm going to be frustrated. I need to learn how to talk to God, find out what's going on between me and him and what he wants to do in my heart, what he's wanting to do in my life. And here's what happens, and this, this is where anger should be kind of a red flag for you. When you start getting angry at your spouse because they're not meeting your needs, uh, you know, better check see if that's something God wanted to do anyway. Amen? That you would come to the place in your life to just say, hey, we need to pray about this. Even when there's conflict, what, would, what do we do? Well, we just argue. You know, we just rather verbally fight it out, you know, and argue over it until some kind of resolution of your way, halfway, whatever way. What would happen if we just stopped saying, you know, this is going nowhere. We, we just need to pray about this. We both need to go pray. And, and I'm sure, you know, that what happens with, when, when I've said that, the devil pops in my mind and says, oh, you're just trying to be spiritual now. Yes. <laughs> That's a good way to be spiritual, is it not? Yes, I'm trying to be spiritual. That's a choice I'm going to make now. To, let's, let's, let's try to do this God's way, and let's see what God wants and what God's will is. Because when we do that, it's a miracle that God can bring into our lives many times and what he does if we just give him the opportunity to do it. But if I'm looking to other places, then God to meet my needs, man, there's going to be a lot of discouragement and certainly a lot of disappointment. You got, one of the things we always talk with new couples about is expectation levels, all right? What are the expectations? Just keep them in realities, all right? You may think 
he's riding a white horse and he has this beautiful silver armor on, all right? But he can't meet all your needs, no matter how valiant he might be. But God can. And never put anybody above God in your relationships. He stays. He's the, he's the one who's the pilot at all times. He's leading. He's guiding. So we can talk to him about the conflicts. We can talk to him about my conflicts. I can talk to him about Kathy's conflicts. I've always accused her of telling God on me. You know, you know are you telling God on me again? You know, and, and taking the Lord first to see what he has do, done or what he wants to do. It's a miracle. What hap can happen many times before it ever gets and boils to a head, how God can take over a situation. So we do what? We pray. Now, put that second because your prayers don't mean much unless you get right with God, all right? So get right with God and pray. Number three, I don't know if this made some of the popular books or not, but it's relevant to us as believers. Are you willing to analyze the problem? Just ask yourself, how much of this is really my fault? I'm not at first. This way you learn to keep your mouth shut and then let God de deal with your heart, you know. Be angry and sin not, you know. Be slow to speak, you know, quick to listen. But it gives you time at this point to, you know, ask the Lord, you know, are there any blind spots? Matthew says, why are you looking at the speck in your brother's eyes and don't pay any attention to the log that's in your own eye? All right? Now, I, I can be a professional at speck inspections. <laughs> I'm pretty good at picking out specks. In my brother's eyes, or my sister. But it's another thing to realize that's just belonging to the spectrum. Up here at this end, it's a lot bigger, and we need to quit being, you know, willing to examine the other end of that deal without looking at this end. Are you willing to look at yourself? Are you willing to analyze your situation? If, there, if there's conflict going on in your life, say, you know, really just how much is just because just I want this? It's just because I want my way. Or is this just a, a desire that I have? And, you know, it's like, is it really even needed? You know, do I just, is this something that, that I really believe that God wants me to stand for, stand up on, and stand with? You know, too often we just blow up over the little specks that are in somebody's life. And we need to ask an honest question to the Lord. Am I just really an impatient individual? Can I be overbearing? I'm always intrigued by people who say, well, my husband's the problem or my wife's the problem. Well, let me just tell you, there's no such thing as a one-person problem. It's our problem if there's a problem. It's our issue. We need to deal with it. It's affecting both of us. Whether it's my end that's a log or your end suspect, whatever it might be, it has to be dealt with. Am I willing to just kind of come to the honesty with the Lord and say, you know, I need to get this right. I mean, what's that passage in Matthew where Jesus says, you know, in Matthew 5, if, if your brother has something against you, you have all against your brother, then you bring your gift to the altar and leave it there. He says, then you go get right with your brother and your gift received. What he's saying? He's saying, if you're not right with each other, it's hindering your worship. <laughs> if you're not right with each other, then it's hindering your worship. It goes much farther than what you realize. It affects you. So the, over and over through Scripture, talks about the importance of, of resolving our problems and resolving our issues. But if we're always maintaining that I have no sin, I have no fault, or I have no failure, 1 John 1, 8 says, you know, hey, if we say we've not sinned, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We could well may be the one who's having the problem here, so I need to ask myself. There's another verse that really links to this, which brings us to point four. If this is a, you know, this, we're not talking about just a casual conflict here, but if there's an ongoing conflict we haven't found resolution on, then you need, to make, you need to make some plans about getting it settled. There needs to be a time you sit down face to face to deal with the real problem. You schedule a peace conference to find out what's really going on in each other's heart and mind. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 7, live with your wives in an understanding way. Underline that part, in an understanding way. All right? We need to, we need to seek to understand because... They may be going through something. Your wife, your husband may be going through something. You, you don't have the full picture. You don't have the full information on. You don't have the full background on. And they're acting in such a way you don't understand it. He says, you live with your wife in understanding as a weaker vessel. She's a woman. You grant her honor. That's a powerful word, is it not? You treat her with respect. Don't think that she, we talked about this last week. Don't think that your wife, 
she's a woman, so she doesn't have what you have, you know. The, Jesus upset the whole social structure. And so did the Apostle Paul when he elevated women to the same class as men. It just blew everybody away. That wasn't the norm, nor was it the national mindset or the social cultural aspect of any of the cultures, whether it was the, Gre the Greeks, the Grecos, the Romans, the Jews. It was just a whole different thing. But Jesus elevates everybody, and he makes us all equal at the cross. And we talked about all this last week, so you go back on Facebook, look at our YouTube channel, you'll hear the sermon where we dealt with this completely, that all ground around the cross of Jesus Christ is level ground. There's nobody any better, and there's nobody any worse than you. It's all ground. And so he said, you honor, and you should love one another, you respect one another, you regard one another. And now he's telling men, you need to regard your wife, you need to respect your wife. And we talked about women respecting their husbands last week. He says, hey... You grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Catch this. Here's this aspect of worshiping. So your prayers not be hindered. Now, I think this obviously, I think you can flip this verse as well. You already told wives to submit to their husband. But what if they don't? Then their prayers are hindered. Then they're not being effective. And they're not living in an understanding way. Someone said, what's that mean? I said, well, it means find out what your wife likes and do that. And find out what she doesn't like and don't do that. <laughs> All right? There's just certain things that sometimes, that, you know, that are, that are we are doing as men that just, I know, upset Kathy. So the Lord said, why are you doing that? You are heirs together of the grace of life. You're in, you're in this boat together. Why are you poking holes in the bottom of it? <laughs> you keep poking holes in it, it's going down. It's going to sink. So he's talking about the fact here that, you know, you need to learn to, to know each other, and you need to learn to understand each other, and you need to learn to comprehend each other. And this takes time, and it takes effort, it takes energy, and it takes patience, and it takes humility. But if you don't, you're not able to worship the Lord effectively. You know? Anybody ever fight on the way to church? That's why you drive your own car. No. <laughs> no, you learn to resolve the situation, and you get the relationship right. Schedule a peace conference. Not close to today's message. Here's how you schedule a peace conference. Now, you don't need a peace conference on every issue that comes up, but there's some things. You, it's like a mountain, you know. Uh, it's got to be climbed, and you're going to have to deal with it, and you're going to learn how to deal with it. How, how do you do that? How do you, how do you have a, a good peace conference? Well, let me show you some ways that will help you out. One most important thing is you've got to choose the right time. And timing's everything. You can't just drop a bomb, all right? You know, it's like an IED. All of a sudden, boom, you walked right into it, and it blew up right in your face, and now you've got problems. You know, worst time? In the middle of a disaster. Worst time when you walk in the door from work. You know, that's not good timing. That doesn't work. Second thing, you want to choose a neutral place. What's that mean? Not in front of the kids. You know, you, you want to choose a, a, a neutral place. Uh, well, the best place is to take your, your iPhones and you silence them, any devices, laptops, computers. You just get them into another room so you're not even preoccupied or look at them if they light up. They're just distractions. You need to be at a place, you know, where there's, where there's no distractions. Let me tell you, not in the bedroom in bed. That's for making love, not making war. I'll just put it in simple terms. All right? Not in, that's not the place. That's not a neutral place. Third thing, you come with the spirit of reconciliation. You come with the spirit of forgiveness. You come with the spirit of humility to say, we have an issue. We're going to find what our way is. We're going to find out what God's way is. We're going to do the right thing in the right way, and we're going to honor the Lord with this. So we're going to pick the, we're going to pick the right time. We're going to pick the neutral place, and we're going to come with the spirit of reconciliation, and we're going to come with humility. And then, most importantly, you have a goal in mind, and you're going to get to your goal to find a resolution to fix this problem. We're not coming to point fingers. We're not coming to say, you, you, you. We're not coming to blame each other. We're coming to find a resolution to whatever this conflict is. And so we're going to take time, and we're going to give a time to it. So suggestions for a peace conference are certainly what we need to adhere to because there are things that will put us in the right frame of mind, in the right heart, and the right spirit. You know, you can't be right in the middle of the and say, peace conference! <laughs> but you can say, hey, we're not getting anywhere here. Let's come back to this. This afternoon, tomorrow morning, whatever's going to be the best time, 
we'll come back to this. And we'll just stay in an attitude of forgiveness and an attitude of humility. And let's see what God is going to do in our life. I think too many people don't understand this whole thing about conflict. They think it's just kind of learning to cope. You know, and if we can learn to cope with each other's differences, there may be some element of that. But hey, the marriage and the home is, is supposed to be a completely different world than what the world presents. Your marriage is not going to be, if, if, if it's Christ-like and godly, it's not going to be anything like what they present on primetime TV, anything they present on the, in the media. It's unique. It's a God thing. It's something that brings glory to God and literally becomes a witness to the world of what God can do with people and how God can restore people's hearts. And even if we have some deep, deep, deep wounds that we've held on to and have been so carrying them on for so long that you can find a place for peace and forgiveness. And what happens all too often is that people come into relationships, into marriage, into relationships, carrying baggage from old wounds and old pains and old scars and old hurts. You know, you got to give God an opportunity to bring healing. And so you've got to present yourself for healing first. Amen? And see what God can do. The Bible says a wounded spirit, who can bear? And if your spirit is wounded, it's a hard thing to bear. A brother offended is harder to be won than a walled city, the Bible says. Somebody that, that's been offended is hard to win back. But if your heart is right and you're willing to let God be God and you're willing to let Jesus Christ lead you and say, I'm staying on the rock, I'm not going to build on sand, I'm going to stay on the rock. It may be tearful, but ultimately it'll be joyful. It may be difficult, but ultimately you'll see the glory of God. It is much easier to make a deliberate decision to restore than it is to divide and destroy. It's destructive, and it'll last for a long, long time. But when you begin to choose God's will and God's purposes and God's ways, it's a miraculous thing what God will do with somebody's life and what God will do with somebody's family. God's way. So I'm saying today, pay attention to your marriage. But again, these principles... Pay attention to all your relationships. The Bible says that God has reconciled us unto himself. What's that mean? God started a relationship with, you, with me through his son, Jesus Christ. God, God reconciled me. But then he turns right around and tells Christians this, the same verse, and God has given you the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, I've been reconciled to God. Jesus did that in my life. And now he's given me this same position in life is that now, I'm a peacemaker. I'm a restorer. I'm a reconciler. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. Pure in heart see God. Listen, there's no way that you're not going to have any issues and difficulties in your life. But what can you do? You can dedicate yourself to Christ, and you can dedicate your home to God, and you can dedicate your life. And when you realize you've failed in certain marriage, you recommit. You get back on course. You get back focused on Jesus. Well, I've failed multiple times. Well, join the club. Hallelujah. But we're not looking back. We're looking forward. So let's look forward. See what God will do and God can do. Let's stand with our heads bowed. I would encourage you to know today that these biblical principles are not just ideas and guidelines. They're the Word of God. And so with the Word of God comes the power of God. In other words, God enables you to receive these principles and not only give you the desire to do it, but it gives you the power to complete and to fulfill whatever those words are to you in your life. So as we come to this invitation today, I want to encourage you. One, if you're not a believer, become a believer today. If there are any of us in the altar today, four or five guys that are standing here, I'd be glad to share with you how you can personally know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But it does require a decision. It's got to be a deliberate act on your part. Say, I, will, I am now choosing to give my heart. I'm choosing to turn from my old life. I'm choosing to turn from my sins and give myself to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. The Bible says it, Jesus said it, you must be born again if you're going to see the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. How does that happen? It's just surrendering. And what happens? What's this rebirth? That's when you spiritually come alive. God makes you alive. That's what he does. You can't do that to yourself. It takes God. And so God brings you to spiritual life, opens your eyes, opens your heart, and makes you a brand new person. Give your life to Christ. Maybe you've drifted from the Lord. I encourage you to recommit your life to Christ today. Come find a place in this altar and say, Lord Jesus, I have I have sinned against you. I have failed, and I just ask you to forgive me. Wash me clean with the precious blood of the Lamb. Make me a new person. Let Jesus come and 
restore you today. Maybe you want to come with your spouse and find a place to pray and recommit. Maybe it's you by yourself need to do some business with the Lord. You're looking for a church home perhaps today. You can come to any of us and say, listen, I believe this is where the Lord would have me serve him. I want to be a part of this church and this fellowship. Understand, first of all, you'll be a part of the fellowship with Jesus. Then you come. Maybe you've never even been followed the Lord in biblical, scriptural baptism since you've trusted Christ. Why don't you come? Say, listen, next time you baptize, I want to be a part of that. I need, I need to make that decision in my life. Maybe you need somebody to pray with you, pray for you. We're here to pray with you and stand with you. But don't let anything stop you or hinder you from doing what God wants you to do today and now. We sing this song of worship. You come. Make that decision God's calling you to make today. Let's be obedient to the Lord. You come. Step out now. When the music fades And all is stripped away Then I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's a void That will bless your you've given to us that clearly guides and describes Lord, your purposes and your will in our life but you haven't left us without direction not only that you've given us your holy spirit to fill our lives to guide our hearts and minds so we thank you for your continued grace we thank you lord for the commitment you've made to us so as we make these commitments day to you we know you've already taken the first step to reach out to meet us take care of the needs that we're facing in our life. Be glorified, Father, in our hearts, in our homes, in Jesus' name.
Amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Glad you came to church today. I am glad you came too. Amen. <laughs> I want to remind you, this is the last Sunday to get in on the marriage conference, all right, in the retreat down in Galveston. Should be dried out by the time we get there in October, hopefully, amen. But come, be a part of this retreat. We've got space still left open. You can come. God will touch your life. It'll touch your marriage. Dr. Michael Smalley is going to be there. We're expecting just God to speak to him and speak to our hearts and our lives. You know, it's, it's just some things I believe personally, and I hold as a very strong conviction so much that it's a part of our whole church life. We do these conferences annually. It wouldn't hurt to do them twice a year <laughs> on marriage and home because there's such an attack and such an assault from this culture we're living in on, on our homes and, and upon our families and upon our marriages. And so it's important that we attend to these things and that they're vitally important. And I don't care how long you've been married, whether it's been two months or 40 years, or 50 years, you will get blessed and received from these times, these conferences. I've been married 42, three years now, all right? And I'm still blessed every time I'm a part of one, and I'm going to them. And that's the reason we've kept doing it year after year after year after year. I mean, there, we've almost had as many marriage conferences as we've had the church started, because that's what an important thing it is for your life, and for your home, and for your marriage. But it's also vitally important for the people you love. You have family, you have friends, you have neighbors. This would be such a tremendous encouragement to them. You know somebody that's struggling. Do what you can to get them here, to be a part of it. Even if it means paying part of their way, it'll be worth your investment in their lives. So I can't encourage you enough to come be a part of it. In fact, I have a word directly from uh, Dr. Michael Small. If you got that ready, you can roll that. Hey, Believers Fellowship, this is Michael Smalley, and I just wanted to personally invite you to the marriage retreat, make sure you're coming. Because I just came out, as you can tell by the beard, came down from the mountains in Colorado. Now I'm ready to have fun and have a great weekend with y'all, so don't miss out. You don't wanna be that couple when all of us return and we got all of our stories and all of our inside jokes, and if you didn't go, you're gonna feel left out, and I don't want anyone to feel left out for this retreat. Because it really is gonna be a blast, and I look forward to seeing y'all there. Yes, amen. It, it, he, it's going to be a, uh, a blessing, and uh, today's the last day, and again, it, it, don't let finances be the reason why you don't go, and please call Stacey tomorrow if that's an issue. Um, you know, one thing we have to do is get past our pride, right? I mean, it, it's a blessing every year, uh, and, and so don't let that be the reason why you don't attend. Uh, and I'm going to go through these, so I have, I actually, look, I actually wrote down the announcements today. Uh, leadership covenant, if you were not at the leadership dinner or you did not fill out your covenant form, please pick up a form in the lobby and put it on Stacy's desk. And at this time, I've asked Linda McMillan to come up and talk about the ladies' Bible study. Sorry, I don't do stairs, so we'll do down here. Okay, the next ladies' uh, Bible study class will begin Tuesday morning. September 25th from 10 to 12, and then Thursday evenings starting September 27th from 6.30 to 8.30. God's Girls uh, for ladies 17 to 28 will start September 29th. You will be meeting at the Starbucks on 2920 near Kirkendall, and you will meet every other Saturday at 10.30. This study is called The Apostles' Creed by Matt Chandler. The Apostles' Creed is a 12-week Bible study and it takes us into the foundations of Christianity for a closer look at what we believe. This study uses the Apostles' Creed to help us grow in our understanding of the Christian faith, live as disciples of Christ, and experience a profound sense of belonging within the kingdom of God. We will be doing weeks 1 through 6 now and weeks 7 through 12 after the first of the year. Sign up and some of the books will be available in the lobby after the service and the books are $13. Child care is available for the Tuesday morning and Thursday evening classes for children up to five years of age. Just be sure that you pre-register for this when you sign up. Thank you. 
Amen. Women's dinner this Friday at 6.30. Spring campus ladies, please bring sandwiches. Child care is available with registration. Youth, back to church Sunday, back to church uh, party tonight at 6 p.m. Now, this is not a slide up there, but Journey 101 is next Sunday, the 23rd. It's not too late. There are forms in the back. That's if you, again, if you want to know more about our church, please do sign up for Journey 101 next Sunday at 4 o'clock. Now, uh, last time, I, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke about how I like to come up once in a while and, and recognize a ministry or a person that's leading the ministry. And this week, I want to recognize uh, Miss Cheryl. Cheryl, Miss Cheryl does a great job of keeping our church clean. Amen. She does a wonderful job. Now, Miss Cheryl does need a break. And so she is going on vacation this week. So I'm asking if you brought anything in the church, please. While you're sitting down, coffee, soda, water, please take it with you uh, as you leave. Uh, Miss Terry has is, is, is agreed to, to kind of clean up, but let's help her out. Amen. Also, Miss Cheryl's in charge of our kitchen ministry, and she does a great job organizing that. We have a standard operating procedure. It's a, it's a white uh, notebook in the kitchen, and so if you want to learn how, you know, what, how to maintain it, how to check it out, the processes, please check out the white binder, the notebook in there, or just get with Miss Cheryl. Uh, she's such a blessing, and that's a one-person ministry, and she does a great job. If you'd like to help out, please see Stacy or Miss Cheryl, and we can sign you up and get you in there, but Miss Cheryl, just thank you for everything that you do for us. <laughs> Food pantry, don't forget to stop by the kitchen for bread and desserts. To our guests, thank you so much for attending our service this morning. Please be sure to complete the connection card again at the end of the service. Uh, our pastor would enjoy the opportunity to get to visit with you and put a gift in your hand. Don't forget your tithes and offerings. That also includes those attending, uh, watching on Facebook. We do not pass a plate. There are offering receptacles in the back. We tithe to be obedient to God's word, but also it is an act of worship. Are you glad you came to church today? Amen. Well, tell somebody next to you and you are dismissed. Don't forget evening services tonight.